Romans chapter 2. We're going to just kind of jump in here and uh, get some of the details here. And uh, really the next plea, we're going to start in verse 11. And the next two pleas, plea number 2, plea number 3, um, are right here in chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 11. For there is no respecter of persons. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And that's plea number two. Um, plea number three starts in verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide to the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolishness, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teacheth another, teachest thou not thyself. That is the case, by the way. You know, when I when you study and you put stuff together, you teach yourself first, and then you go teach, you know, then you start communicating it to other people. Thou that preachest, uh, preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal. Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery. Thou that abhorrest the idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, th through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision ver verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore... If the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is, is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, that's plea three. And I read those with you just so, because we're going to deal with plea two today. Um, otherwise, we would be, you know, into our halftime hour, half hour, and so forth. And, and, and really, we won't get finished with nearly dealing with both pleas, because there's so much going on here. But chapter one, we had the charges laid out. Then the defense stands, the courtroom scene, and in chapter 2 we've already had plea 1, defense plea 1, which is that idea of self-righteousness, I'm not as bad as the other guy is. And uh, then you have now, starting in verse 11 to 16, you're going to have plea 2. And the idea in plea 2 is, is this, the claim of being ignorant of the law. It wasn't given to me, I didn't know what it said, so you can't hold me accountable. You know, we've seen all the mess going on the last couple days in, in, in the different cities. And you know what they're going to plead? I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. And, and it was interesting. I stayed up last night because I was interested in what was going on in Scottsdale because there was no plea. I mean, I saw a thing on Twitter this morning. Uh, protesters were going to meet at Scottsdale Fashion Mall. Rioters, we're going to meet at Scottsdale Fashion Mall. Media, they're going to meet at Scotts, Scottsdale PD. What's going on tonight? Because they put all that that they were going, they're all on social media. It was everywhere, apparently. Anyway, but they were talking about, 
in the stuff going on in downtown Phoenix with the law that once the police say this is an unlawful assembly, disperse, go home, they can arrest anyone and everybody on the street. It triggers that it, it, it triggers that mechanism. Hopefully the governor will come out and do a curfew for a night or two. Then that'll trigger it even more. So if you're because it was funny, the guys I was watching, I was bouncing because they're all idiots. I mean, they're all got people. But between the news people and the guy on Channel 12, NBC, was like, we got to move or they're going to arrest us. And, and then Mark Curtis, bless his heart, he can't get out of his own way sometimes, sitting. And then he goes, what do you mean they're going to arrest you? <laughs> and, you know, don't you, before you speak, you should know some things, you know. Anyway, I get off my step stool here for a moment. But the thing is, is what are they going to do? Well, we didn't know when the police said disperse is an unlawful that it was not that they could arrest us. You, you, okay, they're going to, well, that's not going to stand. That's plea two. Plea three, starting in verse 17 down to 29 there, has to do with this identity, uh, identity idea of, of immunity. You can't judge us because we are God's chosen people. I belong to the right family I'm a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am a Jew. I rest in the law. I'm a teacher. I'm this. I'm that. I look at everything I did. Now, what's going to happen is, is we're going to see as we get down into plea one, or plea two, plea two and three go together. Because the issue is going to be verse 28 and 29 in both scenarios. He is not a Jew which is one, What? outwardly rather he is a jew which is one inwardly it's going to be a hard issue and that's what's going to come out of this because you're going to you got two groups of people verse 12 2 12 for as many as have sinned you've got what without the law right and then you've got a group that is sits and does what in the law okay in the law. So you've got two groups of people here. We've got the Gentiles without the law, and we've got Israel or the Jewish people that have the law. So you got you got two people groups that Paul's going to deal with here, and he's going to hit them over the head with verse 16, both groups, okay? When we get down that that, that issue of the secrets uh of men uh, judge in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. He's going to nail both of them. So chapter 2, verse 11 to 16, will deal with these guys. Chapter 2, 17 to 29, will deal with that group. And again, these are pleas. These are defense mechanisms that man's going to raise, and then Paul is going to argue out and say, eh, thanks for playing, okay? The big family feud X. It isn't going to work. It, that's not on the board. Because Th the Gentiles are going to say what? We didn't have the law. And you know what Paul's going to say, verse 13? For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law... Do what? Do by nature. You see, you didn't, the law wasn't given to you, but by nature you are doing the law. Now, watch verse 13 there. But the doers of the law shall be justified. That's group two. They have the law, but guess what? They're not doing it. They don't do the law. <laughs> One group doesn't have the law. They're doing the law. And the other group doesn't, has the law, isn't doing the law, you know. So we start with two groups. Now come over to chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 9. And here's the, here's the end of the matter, okay. Here, here's really when the verdict gets set in, verse 9. What then? Are we, and that is the issue of Israel, the Jews, better than they, the Gentiles. No, in no wise, for we have before 
proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. See, that's the conclusion. We're not at the conclusion yet, okay? Go back to 2.11. We're, at the, we're, in, the plea, we're in, the, in the defense stage. We're in the argument. Hey, wait a minute. Verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. Again, the context here is the two groups of people. Okay? So we're going to, let's just dive in and look here at, at plea two and, and so forth. When it says here that God, for there is no respect of persons with God, he is not saying that God is being disrespectful of people. I've heard this verse used by people to say, I don't have to respect people. Because, see, God doesn't respect people. That is not what he's saying. God is a fair God. He's a gentleman. We've talked about that. He, will, he, will, he is giving man a fair hearing here. He is being very respectful of mankind. Okay? He has laid in the charges. Then he says, what do you say, defense team? Do you have something to say? And they're going to stand and they're going to say, hey, yes. And he's giving them enough rope to hang themselves is what he's doing. But he's letting, he's hearing them out. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So you and I, if God, again, the verse doesn't mean that God is, is disre, disrespectful of people. And also it doesn't mean that we can be disrespectful of people. Okay? Because what happens is, is, well, if it's good for God, then it's good for me, and I don't have to respect them. No, you and I ought to trip over ourselves to respect people. Okay? Now, hoodlums and all the stuff we've seen, that's different. That's a, they're in a different category. You know, I, I was listening yesterday, uh, 2 Timothy 2, to some of the chatter in the afternoon and everything. We, we were out in the morning and stuff, and, uh, you know, a couple of the commentary taters said, you know, we were with Minneapolis with the death of George Floyd. By the way, you ought to read the Christianity Today has got a great article about him and what he did in the inner city for Christ and working in groups and people in, in, his, in his hood, as he called it, and stuff. So evidently he's probably a believer um, from the way it sounded, doesn't know right division or anything, but at least he had a, a clear gospel. But they were saying we were with Minnesota and Minneapolis on that until what happened? All the stupid stuff happened, all the riots, and it diminished in a way that, well, you know what, that's a point there, because how many of us have sympathy for it now? I mean, not for we do for George Floyd, but just for the whole scene, it wanes away. And that's a natural thing. But when it comes to you and I, 2 Timothy 2.24, And the servant of the Lord must not, what? Strive. But be gentle unto who? All men. See, that takes a respect of man there. Because what are we looking at? Come back over to Romans. Uh, uh, on your way back to 2, stop in 12. What are we looking at? We're looking at that inner man thing. See, that's what we're looking at. Romans 12 has taught us this, uh, and, and when we get over here, obviously we'll spend a great amount of time in Romans 12, but if you look at verse 18, uh, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Well, in order to do that, that means you have an understanding of man and a respect for what's going on. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Romans 12, 17, verse 18, if it be possible... As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, that's a great verse to help you in, in, in moments of strife and contention and you don't know what to do. What do you do? Well, you're gonna, you want to live peaceably. So we've got to make some decisions. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, in other words, the servant of the Lord shouldn't what? Strive, but be gentle and meek and apt to teach. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So how do you do that? Well, you're, you're after something that's going on inside the person. And when you come on back on to chapter 2, when you see their outward activity happening, you can identify that as just sinful man, but let's, let's get him to be un, not a sinner anymore. Let's get him in Christ. So go down there, you know, I, if you do, put on a shield and, a, you know, go load, armed and loaded. <laughs> because those guys aren't listening to anything. You know, the best thing to do is stay out of it. Stay away from the whole scene, you know. But anyway, but the thing is, is when verse 11 says, for there is no respect of persons with God, he's not talking about disrespecting people. He's talking about the fact is, is that God will not, cannot be swayed, can't be influenced by anyone. Come over to Matthew 22. The, that issue of, the innocent are the guys that had the best lawyers. That's, you know, hey, hey, that's the issue there. If you're a rich guy, you're going to get off scot-free. Not in the judgment of God, you don't. He can't be influenced. It doesn't mean that we're, 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 we're to be, you know, disrespectful of people and not care about people and so forth, but rather it's an understanding of in the context, in these two people groups, guess what? They are all equally sinners. I mean, think about the nation of Israel and the status that they have with God. Not had, but hath. They are God's people. Who are you? We're dogs. We eat the crumbs from the table. See? But see, the thing is, is Paul's saying, listen, the judgment of God is equal across the board. Matthew 22, verse 15. Notice the Lord here talking to uh, the Pharisees. Then went the Pharisees, I'm, I'm sorry, the Herodians. Uh, verse 15, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Took counsel. They had a board meeting. How are we going to get him? Let's go get him. How are we going to do that? Verse 16, and they sent him out unto him, their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master. Now watch what they say. We know that thou art true. You know they don't believe that. So they're doing what with him? They're buttering him up. Get a little flattery rolling on him. And teach us the way of God in truth. Again, they don't believe the truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Isn't that interesting what they say about him? And again, it's, it's an issue of, of uh, not being swayed, not being moved. Come over to Luke 20. Luke 20. That was Matthew 22, 15 and 16. Come over to Luke 20. So when he says he's not a respecter of persons, it's an issue of these two people groups are equal. There's not a difference here at all. Luke 20, verse 21, Luke 20, 21. And they ask him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly. I love that. Boy, these chief priests and scribes, they are just slick. They are smooth. We know, we know how you really are. And teachest rightly, neither accepteth thou the person of any but teach us the way of God truly. So when you come back to Romans 2, again, they are saying, we know you're not going to be influenced. They've tried. It failed. In Paul and Romans, what is man going to do? Wait a minute, don't you know who I am? I'm billionaire, whatever. Look at, I helped put a, you know, what did we just have? The blast off, the, the SpaceX Dragon Endeavor. I, I helped put all that up. whoop de doo buddy. What's going on with who you are inside of you? Verse, verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Again, I'm not influenced by who you are by your circumstance, 
by your situation, your status, how many degrees you've got behind you. You know, we get, we get influenced that way when we see the, doc, the degrees behind people's names and so forth and all this, you know, all, all of their notoriety, you know. Um, Oscar Woodall, when he was alive, he, he, was, uh, he was a very interesting uh, man, and uh, he was the top salesman for MetLife Insurance in the whole of the United Kingdom. He was, they sent him to London to open the London office, and he, out, so he, he made more money than the, big, than the CEO guy. But he would walk into CEOs of companies and uh, just walk into the boardrooms. He just had that ability to do that and that knack. And you know what he would do? He would go in, and you know what? He was never swayed by who he talked to. And he would just simply say, hey, has anyone loved you enough to ask you where will you spend eternity if you die? What a question to ask. You know, these bigwigs, movers of commerce and shakers, and he just get a, get an appointment, do it right, do it respectful, but then yet just walk right in and, you know, do his get the business of the day done, but then at the end of the at the end of the meeting say, "Hey, I got a, I have another question for you." <laughs> and then lay the gospel on them, you know. We get swayed the Lord says, I'm not swayed by that. No matter who you are, without the law or in the law. Now notice, without the law, what are they going to do? What's going to happen to them? They're going to perish. In the law, they're going to be judged, aren't they? There's some things that are going to, they're going to be judged by it, actually. Get, get it right. They're going to be judged by the law. See, there's some things happening here. There's some things going on. And Paul now is going to stand and answer both groups. The first group here we're going to get this morning. Next week we'll get plea two with the Jews and so forth because of the amount of, uh, of coverage. Verse 12. <clears throat> Verse 13, I'm sorry. Four. four. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. This is a warning, and it's a warning to both groups. To the Gentiles, what are they going to say? We don't have the law, and yet we're doing the law. The Jews are going to say, we got the law, but they're not doing the law. So he's warning them now. Hey. You guys, you got trouble. You're going, there's going to be some judgment. There's going to be some perishing um, and so forth. All right, without the law, verse 12 here. Come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And just notice um, the issue of without the law. Obviously, we know that that is the Gentiles. We know that in history... Uh, God never gave the law directly to the Gentiles, the Mosaic law. Deuteronomy 4, verse number 7. And, and there, he does give his law to a, a specific nation, verse 7. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we can call, that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So if he's like, what nation is so great, that means all the other nations are what? Not great. They didn't get the law. The Gentiles don't receive the law, as in God handing it to them. Okay? Come back with me to, to Genesis. Genesis and chapter number 3. However, Romans 7, when we get over there, we're going to learn that the law of God is righteous. It, it, the law is not the problem, it's the person, the people. Okay, Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, we have the fall of Adam and Eve, the fall of humanity. The curse is out there, verse 20. And Adam called his, wife na his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. 
Now that's an interesting thing there. He made coats of skin and he clothed them. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he be put for, uh, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So man has exited the, the garden, right? 4.1. And Adam knew, his, uh, knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass. Now notice that very carefully. Something has happened in chapter 3 of Genesis and verse 24. And now in, in Adam and Eve with Cain and Abel, verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell, and off he goes. Okay. Now, I bring this up because what you're reading here is the issue of an animal sacrifice. That's what you're reading about. You're reading about the fact that God is showing Abel how he clothed him in skin, back up there in verse 21. And he's teaching him, what did Abel, what did Cain bring? His own labor, the fruit of the ground, right? Out of the garden, here he comes. But what did Abel bring? Notice carefully how the verse reads. He brought of the what? The firstlings of the flock. When they were to bring the Passover lamb together, where was that lamb coming from? The firstlings of the flock. No spot, no blemish, perfect. And what were they to do with that lamb? Cut it, sacrifice it, cook it, eat it, the whole, all of it. But that's under Leviticus, Levitical law, Moses. But look at Abel. He's doing it right here. And Abraham's doing, I mean, uh, Abel's doing it. Verse 3, and in the process of time, it came to pass. You know what Abel did? I'm sorry, Adam did. He sat with Cain and Abel, and he taught them about the Passover sacrifice and what it meant. He actually has told them where to take it. Chapter 3, verse 24, where were they to take it? To the cherubs. Do you remember reading about Israel and some cherubs sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant? Once a year, what was that high priest going to do? Take in that offering and so, okay. All of that stuff we see back on Moses gives them out. In de he has already been communicating that to man. You see, I, that's what I want you to see. Okay, come over to chapter 12. Abraham. Um, I gotta find Abraham, chapter fourteen. You got Abraham, Abraham's father, Abraham. Okay, he's the beginning of the seed line. He's the beginning of, uh, I shouldn't say the seed line. He's the beginning of the nation of Israel and so forth. He's one of the founding fathers. Verse uh, eighteen, Genesis fourteen eighteen, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. By the way, Salem ends up being Jerusalem. Okay, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Why do we have priests when we don't have a temple or a tabernacle ordinance yet? But yet, what do we have? We have a priest, don't we? But he's a priest of God, of the Most High God. And he blessed and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High, and so forth. You see, by the way, Abraham's going to bring an offering to him. Chapter 15, Abraham's put in a, uh, in a deep sleep and sees all that stuff. Come on back to Romans 2. My point is, is the law, when he gave it to the nation of Israel, the law stuff, that moral compass had already been going in man. Why? 
Because in Romans 1, what did, where did he put it in verse 19? He put it in man, okay? Now, I jumped ahead of myself. I, Romans 2, without the law. Now, come over to Ephesians 2. Let's just look here and get back on track. <clears throat> I jumped ahead of myself there, thinking about it. <laughs> you see, when he, when he says, the nation that I gave my law to was Israel not the Gentiles. Yet what did the Gentiles do? By nature, they went and did the law. There's something going on inside man. But look at Ephesians 2, thinking about without the law and in the law. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. Do you think they like each other, these two groups? Not at all. At that time, you are without Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. That's what Israel, that's Israel's government style, is a commonwealth. Okay? And by the way, what is a commonwealth? It's common. Everything's common. Okay? Uh, and strangers from the covenants and promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Drop down to verse uh, 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the what? Mill a wall of partition is that issue of circumcision, but there is a difference going on here. A big difference between the two groups. A clear the, 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 uh, uh, difference. And that issue of the law is where the difference lies. One it's given to, and the other it is not. Israel had the advantage. Come back to Romans 2. They have an advantage. Romans chapter 2. They had a natural standing. They have a, really, they have a, 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 a wonderful argument to roll out in that they had a natural standing. They naturally are God's people. By nature, they were privileged and favored and blessed. By the way, that is what they're going to argue. <laughs> Immunity. You know, when you see us, you should see Father Abraham. <laughs> you know. 2.17 Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law. They rest in the law. Verse 18 and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. They have an advantage. They rest in the law. They, 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 they let the law fortify them. They know some things. They approve some things. Chapter 3, verse 1, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. You go over back into Psalms 147, and that oracles of God, that's the Word of God. They had the Word of God. They were looking at, a, they had the advantage. The Gentiles are disadvantaged. They have no hope. They are without, verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 12, they are without the law. Now, the law. The law, that's a wonderful concept. And when we get over into chapter 7 of Romans, we'll, we'll, we'll look into the law. The word law, okay, that word, L-A-W, simply means that which governs or has tendency to rule. That's what that word means. Power to control, okay? Well, we had, you've heard a lot lately about the color of law. Well, that's very specific. When he talks here in Romans 2 about without the law, he's being very specific. He isn't just saying anything out there that controls you and governs you. What's he talking about? The law of who? God. The law that he, the law that he has taken and begins to codify everything in society. Uh, there's like 613 or something. I read one time a guy counted 800 and something different laws. But in the law, there's a moral law, right? Thou shalt not steal, commit adultery, murder. There's a civil law that if you take one sheep, how many do you owe back? 
two, fourfold, a hundredfold different. There's a civil matter, okay? If you steal, what do they do with your hand? Cut it off. That's a civil issue. I love the one about the parents with the riotous child. They take him up to the judge and turn him over to the judge. <laughs> yeah, you're being a riot. I, I always wondered, how do you determine if your child's really being riotous? Riot this. <laughs> you guys judge that. But they, So you have the civil law component, you have the moral component, and then you have the ceremonial component, the Sabbath day and stuff like that. But what does that law do? What does the law of God do? It does what? It begins to codify how man is going to exist. Think, but what does man do with it? They begin to question it, don't they? Think about our Constitution. I try to think of illustrations we can all, you know, kind of understand. What do they use? What do the lawyers and all the guys usually do with our Constitution? What did the founding fathers originally mean by that? What did that word mean back in the 1700s, you know, and now what does it mean? You know, you can't use the word gay anymore, you know, gay apparel or any of that. You know, we sing the songs and so Why? Because that word has changed over. So, uh, you know, so what do they do with it? They begin to get into it and they begin to argue what does it really all mean? If you're arguing that, then that means you've read it. That means you're paying attention to the details in it. That means you have it in it, in, in your hand. And what the Gentiles are going to argue is we never had it in our hands. It was never given to us. God, you gave it to Israel. You didn't give that to me. When did you put that in my hands? You see what's going to happen here? You see, what man's going to do is start arguing the letter of the law and the details. You, How can you tell me that I should not have committed adultery or committed murder? That was never a law given to me. So you can't hold me accountable. You have to set me free. Dismiss. Mistrial. Kick him loose. Thank you for your time. They begin to plead ignorance, don't they? I didn't know that the law said I couldn't do that because I never had the law. It was never given to me. See how man's going to do that? We do it today, when we, like when we talk about the Constitution and different things, you know. Where does it say in black and white, that there's a separation of, you know, bah, you know, whatever, you know, we just get all balled up in the what? In the details. But look at verse, you need to be in Romans 2. Are you there? All right, I get all wound up. Forget to tell you where to go. <laughs> Roman, look at verse 14. 2.14, Romans 2.14. So man says, you didn't give it to me. I never had it. I never looked at it. And you know what God says? You're right. I didn't give it to you, Gentiles. You're right. I did give it to my people, my nation. So the Gentiles are like, cool, I'm off. <laughs> I'm off the hook. Let me in the, <laughs> the pearly gates. <laughs> Send me on in, you know. Hey, goofy man. They're going to say goofy things. But before he says you're free to go, he says, verse 14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, in other words, you're right, you don't have the law. I didn't give it to you. Do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. And you know what the Gentile does? Oh, doggone it. I was that close to getting let free. Because look at what he just said. You didn't get the law. You're right. But yet you are doing the law. And you're doing it by nature. So God's got you. <laughs> doing it by, you're, do by nature. Um, come back to chapter 1. 
of Romans. You see, man's going to say, I didn't have the specific laws, God. I didn't have the specific moral, civil, ceremonial details, the ABCs. I didn't get to 613. I, I heard about the top 10, but I just thought that was a bunch of fooey and hooey, and I just dismissed it. And yet God's going to say, yet you did have a moral compass. You did have something by nature. Romans 1.19, we looked at this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. They do, when, when the Gentiles do by nature the things contained in the law, they are ex expressly demonstrating that they understand the difference between right and wrong. They understand the very difference between good and evil. Righteousness, good and bad. Righteousness and evil. They are demonstrating that they understand. By the way, they've already demonstrated it in plea one because they said what? I'm not as bad as that guy. They're demonstrating, come back to chapter two, that they have a conscience. So what God's doing here is, is and Paul is articulating in the, in the rebuttal to the plea, is that you, you can't argue the letter of the law here. Because God took the very law that he wrote down and gave to his people, he put it in you. He wrote that in you. He put a mechanism in you to understand between right and wrong. Adam takes Eve, takes the boys, Cain and Abel, and he, what does he do? In the process of time, they knew. He taught them. It's coming from inside of you. They knew. Verse 14, when they do by the things contained in the law, these, ha these having not the law are a law unto themselves. What does that law demand? Yeah, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I, I have uh, recently with some of our young folks getting into first responder position, jobs and careers and so forth. What law demands that a first responder go running into a burning building or a chaotic scene? What law demands that? There's no law that demands that. That's something from where? Inside. 9-11 happened. What law demanded that those firefighters and, and port authorities and police officers go running to the scene? I mean, running to the scene. Not going, eh, hey, we'll get there. But they go. There's, there, it's an internal thing, isn't it? That's what Paul's getting at. There's a deeper issue here, Gentiles. There's a deeper issue here, man, without the law. And it's in verse 16 where he says, In the day when God shall judge the what? The secrets of men. You see, Paul is moving this away from just arguing the letters. What does it really mean? And yet he's getting down into the secrets of the hearts of men. Because this issue, and what Paul is demonstrating here, is that this is a heart issue issue. It is not an issue of whether you had the law or didn't have the law. It's an issue of what's going on inside of your heart. God doesn't deal with how smart you are about the precepts of the law. Well, I know that if I claim ignorance, I'll get off with manslaughter. Because in Leviticus, blah, 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 it says, blah, 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 you know. He's not talking about that at all. But rather, it's a heart issue. You do possess a moral compass. You do, man, I'm talking about man, not you guys. You guys already understand this. I'm talking about man. You know that there is moral absolutes. Thou shalt not steal. We ingrain that in our children from day one, don't we? That's not yours. That belongs to your brother. Put it back. 
that's not yours. It belongs to the store. Now put it back. <laughs> you know, I can remember the first time I went home with a candy bar that wasn't bought, paid for. I remember it to this day. And I was a little dude. And I still remember the whooping. <laughs> and never did it again. Why? Because we ingrained that. We, that's a moral thing. Look at verse 15, 215. Would show the work of the law written where? In their hearts. Isn't that interesting? Their what? Conscience. You see, we have a conscience. And we have in, in our conscience, that's that mechanism of your soul, that's the norms and standards that are used to evaluate your behavior. Does my behavior match? Then that little voice in your head, you know, you thought it was God, but it's just you. And he says, hey, that behavior was wrong. And you need to go make it right. Now, who influences your conscience? One, chapter one, chapter one verse 19 is God. He wrote in some things in your DNA. But then the next one is your mom and dad. Parents. That's why parents are so critical. Then you got grandparents. They're like 2A, you know. Parents 2A, grandparents 2B. Why? Because who you spend so much time with them. And they begin to ingrain things. Then you've got your peer groups and your outside influences, and you've got the Word of God and your church family, things like that. All of that begins to bear witness. Isn't that interesting? Also bearing witness. And their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing. You know what God's doing here through Paul is he's demonstrating that man has a conscience. They understand what is morally right and wrong, what's right to be done. So the issue with Paul, the issue here that he's laying out is, yeah, the Gentiles, you didn't have the law. We're not talking about the letter of the law. We're talking about what's going on inside of your heart. We're talking about what's going on inside of you, in your conscience. So the Gentiles are going to argue ignorance. God didn't give us the law. He didn't give it. He gave it over there to those people. We never had the law. What are you talking about? And God says, yeah, you're right. I never gave you the law, but you know what? I put in you some of the precepts of right and wrong. And man, when you did it, you demonstrated where your heart was. And you demonstrate what's going on inside of you. You follow that? I hope you see that because this is a hard issue. That's what makes 2.16 now understandable when he talks about the heart issue. Because when he's talking about here now, it is in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. How The question that I always ask is, how does God judge Adam based on the revelation of the Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. He doesn't because Paul's gospel demonstrates an issue here about the heart is the issue. Now, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. Um, obviously, in the day is going to go back up there in verse 5 against the day of wrath. So that's a great white throne judgment because we're talking about sinners. Okay, But notice this issue about judging the secrets. Come back with me to Psalms chapter 44. Psalms 44. We've got to go, go quick here. Psalms 44 and verse 21. Psalms 44, 21. Psalms 44, verse 21. Shall God, I'm sorry, shall not God seeth this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Psalms 90. Verse 8, Psalms 90 and verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. So notice, he knows everything, doesn't he? He, nothing is going to be, every idle word. You ever... Maybe you didn't do this, but have you ever run across someone? Thou shalt not murder. 
but yet there's somebody you really would like to see dead. I would really like to just see that person. But I didn't do it. But you know what you are? You're still guilty. Because what did the Lord say? If you think it, you did it. Right? He moved it from the activity to the heart. That's a hard issue. So that's what Paul's getting at. Come back to, to Romans uh, Romans 5. You see, Paul's saying here, he's def- his rebuttal to the plea is that you can't use ignorance of the law as a defense. It's not about what you know. It's about what's in your heart and what your heart compels you to do. And when your heart compels you to do something, it's going to demonstrate whether you're doing the works of the law or whether you're doing something right and wrong. Romans 5 Verse 12, wonderful verses in here. Uh, uh, You know, every word is important. Romans 5, 12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So when sin's around, what's what's the result of sin? Death, right? Verse 13, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Without the law, you don't know if you sinned or not. But sin is still there, isn't it? Why? Because, well, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. When did the law show up? With Moses, right? So what did death do? It reigned from Adam to Moses. But sin was there, but there was nothing there telling the people that what they were doing was what? Violating the law of God. Follow that? But yet they still did what? They still died. You see, the issue here isn't the ability to adhere to the law. The law is not even there from Adam to Moses. The issue is a deeper problem, and it's called the sin nature, the heart issue. Because what did they do? They still died. And if you don't believe it, go read Genesis 10, and everybody in that passage dies. It's the death chapter. What did they have? They died. They died. Why? Because sin was in the situation. Now, come back to 2.16. Romans 2.16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the question, does God judge Adam based on Jesus Christ according, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? The answer is no. Okay? It, flat out no. So then how does God judge? He judges according to my gospel. So now there's an issue, there's some things here that Paul is introducing in. He will detail detail later in chapter 3 more. But he's detailing the issue here that God isn't going to judge people on whether they understand the mystery truth. That is not the issue. It has nothing to do with people's ability to understand the revelation of the mystery. However, he's going to judge people based upon what? My gospel, Paul's gospel. So there's a dispensational point that Paul's going to make here. In Paul's gospel, and because of time, I'm just going to say this, and again, we're going to get into it. In Paul's gospel dispensationally, we understand that Paul's gospel is not a continuation of the law. We understand that. So the criteria of the judgment of men has nothing to do with the law. It isn't about the letter of the law. It's about what's going on in man's hearts. You you follow? Okay. It has everything, it doesn't have anything to do with the law. Rather, it has everything to do with the heart of the individual. Now, there are roughly five things, if you will, a lot more, but five major things that Paul's gospel reveals, puts out there, pulls them. That's why Israel needs Paul, so they can understand this as well. Paul's gospel exposes the core problem 
with all of humanity. Sin nature is exactly right. Paul, the law said what? If you do it, I'll bless you. The law said you're what? Guilty because you can't do it. Paul says, you know why you couldn't do it? Because you got a thing called a sin nature. Every time the Pharisees and the Lord go toe-to-toe, somewhere in the conversation, the fact that they're descendants of Father Abraham comes up. He looks at Nicodemus in John 3, and he says, Nick, you have to be born again. Born once into the descendants of the line, physically into the nation of Israel, but now we've got to fix the spiritual problem because you are still the son of Adam. You're still a sinner. So the first issue is Paul's gospel exposes the core problem that impacts all of humanity, and that's that sin nature. And that's the primary problem with all of mankind, whether you're on this side of the board or that side of the board. Number two, Paul's gospel reveals that that change happens in the inner man, not in the outward man. Again, he's, chapter 2 there, verse 28, he's not a Jew which is one outwardly. Verse 29, he's a Jew which is one inwardly. Number three, Paul's gospel exposes the absolute inability of the law to accomplish this change in the inner man. Can't be done. Done, Can never be done. Number four... Paul's gospel exposes the absolute inability of the law to justify you. We'll look next time. We'll go over into Galatians and we'll see some of that, okay? It could never do it. It was never designed to do it. Romans 11, he says that the law was designed to push Israel to Christ. And number five, Again, just for time's sake, Paul's gospel reveals that there is only one response that God will ever accept, and that is the response of faith. So how does God judge Noah according to the my gospel? By what? By faith. Because what did Noah do? He obeyed God and went and built the boat and put his family on it, was out there a preacher of righteousness, telling people there's wrath, judgment coming. He was doing everything God told him to do. And by faith, Paul's gospel is the only gospel that says that the whole issue with God is faith alone. Do you? So in 2.16, when they stand there and he's going to judge the Gentiles, they're going to say... We didn't have the law. You didn't give that that book to us. You didn't give us the oracles of God. You didn't give us Moses' commandments. You didn't give us any of that stuff. And God's going to say, yeah, you're right, I didn't. But that foolish heart of yours, chapter 1, verse 21, that chapter 2 here, verse 5, the hardness and penitent heart that you had, You see, that heart issue is what got you in trouble. Because you went by nature and did some things that equal out to the law. So it's just like that thing in 319 where they made the whole world guilty. The law did that. You follow? So in 216, the issue isn't the letters. The issue isn't arguing out the minutia of the law. The issue is... Paul's gospel says it, the issue is faith alone. That's the issue. So when the secrets of men, of all of humanity, from Adam to the last man, stand before God, the issue isn't go, is going to be the heart. And that plea of ignorance isn't going to get the job done because it's never been about the letters and the precepts. It's been about the heart to do them. It's been the, that hard issue. Okay? Now, we're over time a couple minutes, but I wanted to get through at least plea two. Because <laughs> in plea three, we're going to go to this side of the board, and he's going to introduce them, and guess what he's going to tell them? Same thing. You guys have the law. You didn't do the law, and it was because you got a heart problem. So fix the heart problem. But how do you do that? 
by my gospel. That's how you fix the heart problem, okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your Son, for all, all of the blessings and the benefits and the promises that you've given to us in him. We thank you for that. In your name we pray.